of meetings and this level of academic scholarship. So I'm privileged to be here listening to this. Um, I think it's interesting to talk about the taboo history. We all know about what's happened at UNESCO and Havron and the Temple Mount and how the history is being made taboo. It's, it's taboo not only for Jews, but also the people that live in these countries. For example, when I went to Beirut, Lebanon um, in 2009 to, uh, to, to be a part of a conference for um, Iraqi scholars, actually, I was struck by the fact that there was a magazine there, and I'll show it to you since we're using audiovisual. This was a leading. This is a leading publication in Beirut, Lebanon, called Executive, and the cover story, which was all over CNN in the Middle East, uh, advertising this story, was Jews of Lebanon rekindling the community. I was fascinated by this. The same thing has gone on in Iraq and in uh, Kurdistan, in Iraq as well. Main Iraq and Kurdistan, Iraq, with various publications talking about the Jews that live there and really regal, regaling themselves in this wonderful community that existed in the Arab countries. So I found that fascinating that there was such a nostalgia to know about it and also talk about how great their Jews were, whether it was Iraq talking about the Iraqi Jews or in Lebanon talking about the Lebanese Jews and mentioning the names and how well they'd done. But the actual history is quite taboo within those countries but I would dare say also the United Nations. The United Nations, when the U.S. went into Iraq, uh, did a story about all of the Jews that had lived there um, in Iraq. And so, of course, uh, being an Iraqi Jew, I went to see what those names were. So the New York Times, November 14, 2002, just before the U.S. went in, um, stated mentioning every group other than Jews who have lived in Iraq for 7,000 years, including Akkadians, Armenians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Byzantines, Chaldeans, Christians, Amalites, Kurds, Mamluks, Mongols, Nestarians, Persians, Sabaeans, Shiite Muslims, Sumerians, Sunni Muslims, Turkoman, Urantans, and Zoroastrians. Pretty long list, didn't mention Jews. Um, so, again, I, w I was struck by what was going on, and as I talk about the taboo topic of the scope of Jewish property and artifacts of cultural heritage left behind in Arab lands, part of what I'm talking about is that it's hard to get the information. It's kind of taboo on both sides to even acknowledge what went on. So for a long time in Israel, there was not much talk of the actual history of the Jews that came from the Arab countries. Or when there was, there was a narrative ap applied about being pioneers of Chalutzim. At the same time, there were a narrative of what happened to the property, both cultural and physical property and real estate property. So there was this narrative going on in those countries those in the Middle East, in Israel, but also outside. So when you talk about the New York Times or other publications, very hard to find any mention of Jewish refugees. Uh, very scattered. Uh, the first mention of Jewish refugees by the Times after November uh, 2002, where they were left out, comes in an op-ed cartoon, not even an article, but an op-ed cartoon in uh, the New York Times in 2003 talking about the Hanukkah menorah and just showing the menorah. So there was some symbolism, yes, Jews lived there, and this is the Hanukkah menorah, which happens to be one I brought over at that point by Oded Halami. Now I want to talk to you about what's going on in terms of cultural heritage, because as I'm saying, the information is not as deep as I would like it to be. So we, of course, have the the Iraqi Jewish archives, and um, I'm not going to go into that right now, 
except to say that in the brochure they talked about the property that was um, stripped from the Jews um, and uh, when they took their citizenship. So that acknowledgement I think was important by the Iraqi Jewish archives um, and I am thankful for the archives and Doris Hamburg for her part in that. Um, now what I'd like to talk about are the MOUs and laws uh, for quote unquote protecting cultural property from certain Arab countries. Let's talk first about Syria. Uh, public Law 114.151 applies to Syria as of August 15, 2016 for Jewish religious and cultural artifacts including specifically Torah scrolls that are spelled out and explained um, written on or before 1920. Okay. Um, so, there, there are um, a public law and it applies to this property and if you cannot show that these artifacts were properly obtained, they have to be sent back under customs law. Iraq, the Emergency Protection for Iraqi Cultural Antiquities Act of 2004, Title III of the Public Law 1008-429, this is U.S. law, as amended effective April 30th, 2008, to designate the types of imports restricted in Section 9F includes Torahs on parchments made on or before 1990, noting there have been an active Jewish community in Iraq since at least 586 BC. So everything from this active community until 1990 is covered by that. Torahs used in these communities, and I'm quoting, are parchment scrolls bearing Hebrew writing in black ink. The scroll is wound around two wooden rods, just in case you don't know what we're talking about. And metal finials may cover the tops of the rods. The Torahs are housed in a cylindrical case of wood that may be uh, decorated with inscriptions and or semi-precious stones approximately 100 centimeters high. For Egyptian cultural artifacts, and they go into many different groups, but they do specifically go into ones that are Jewish artifacts, the MOU with Egypt is effective as of December 5th, 2016 for religious artifacts, including Torahs, which they specifically mention, again, all of those specifically mentioned, credited in honor before 1517 AD. Finally, Libya. The proposed MOU with Libya met for hearings at the U.S. State Department on July 19, 2017, after publishing a notice in the Federal Reserve on June 16, 2017. That's, by the way, after that point that I was contacted and told about the previous MOUs, the ones with Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. For hearings, um, now, on June 16, the Federal Registry said that there would be hearings on religious artifacts, including writings on parchment, made on or before 1911 AD, specifically talking about Torah objects and other Jewish objects and writings. So we now have 1911, 1920, 1517 for Egypt, um, and um, 1990 on or before for Iraq. Um, so that's the first piece. There is still no action uh, by the U.S. State Department on this proposed Libya MLU, um, and it's still pending as of my knowledge. These laws and MOUs are all recently enacted within the past two years, except the Iraqi, and that was 2008, and did not seem to consider the claims of Jews and the other minorities that were ethnically cleansed from Syria. Uh, now, of course, we said there were less than 12 Jews. I have less than 50, but whatever. Uh, Iraq, only four remain. Egypt, less than 75. I think we said about 12 there um, also. And Libya, no Jews remain. True ethnic cleansing, which I'm going to get into in a minute. This means that um, where the Jews were ethnically cleansed from Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and possibly Libya, if the MOU is adopted for Libya, the Jewish refugee art, uh, religious articles, the Jewish religious articles, including Torahs created on or before certain dates, would have to be returned to the country which was ethnically cleansed of Jews. 
Note that ethnic cleansing violates international law, and I'm going to talk about that more for my Fordham International Law Review article. Jewish Refugees from Arab Countries, Examination of Legal Rights, a Case Study for Human Rights Violation, uh, volume, uh, Human Rights Violations of Iraqi Jews, Volume 26, Number 3, March 2003. Often the only way to obtain the Torahs, and this is my language, are by trying to get them surreptitiously into the country. Okay? Thus, these religious articles will be returned to the countries which, quote, stole or expropriated them under color of law in some cases. Okay? So in some cases, these items were taken. Um, most of the Torahs from Arab countries were inscribed on the teak, the cylindrical uh, scroll case, with the name of the party who provides the Torah. The Torah is only often on loan to the synagogue while the person or family attends the synagogue and can be removed by the family when they leave. This is what happened in Yangon or Rangoon, uh, Myanmar, Burma. Therefore, the Torahs may or may not be communal property and should be allowed to travel with the individual and or community once it is forced to leave the country. In either case, Jews from these Arab countries would not willingly leave these precious religious artifacts, including Torahs, behind. In indeed, if a Torah is dropped by accident, the whole Jewish community must fast under Jewish law. These Torahs were left behind due to ethnic cleansing and not abandonment. Um, question to ask, why were these MOUs so recently and hastily enacted? where there was not an opportunity really for a lot of organizations to respond. In fact, I don't know of any Jewish organizations responding. Any responses that were given for Libya were given through somebody that already had a place to speak as, as a historian of antiquities, um, and that's how we were able to get some of the information in. Um, uh, why is illicit trafficking considered a factor where Torahs and other religious artifacts are uh, stolen or expropriated under a color of law if they are then returned to their communities in exile. So that's a question to ask. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about what happened in Iraq, just to give you a flavor of what the Jews of Iraq were able to take out. Jews of Iraq were only able to take out, it, this is from 5051, uh, three outfits, three winter outfits, summer outfits, three winter outfits, one pair of shoes, one blanket, six pairs of underwear, socks, sheets, one wedding ring, one wristwatch, one thin bracelet, and no more than 50 dimars. According to Levin in Closed Doors, the book he wrote, no prayer books, photos, or heirlooms were allowed to be taken out. So, then in March 30th, 1951, just so we finished the Iraq piece, um, there was also a Muslim fatwa that, banned, uh, that was passed and published in El Yazak, um, which was a well-known uh, newspaper at the time, which forbade Muslims from buying Jewish property. So, of course, as we discussed with Iraq, in 1950, uh, there was a law passed that if you gave, gave up your citizenship, you could leave the country. And that's when Jews started to apply, and applied en masse, where we got 95% of the community leaving. Uh, then in 1951, a law was passed that any Jew who had given up their citizenship would, um, would have all their property expropriated, except for what I just read you. And that's the minimal. Think about starting a new life as a refugee with 50 dinars and a little bit of clothing, and your wedding ring, and maybe one thin bangle. That's it. You couldn't take your prayer books specifically. You couldn't take your heirlooms. And you could, of course, take your communal property like Taras. It was prohibited. So I just, I just want to make that point in the context of what I'm reading, to make it real. Um, and I can cite you all of the, uh, the different passages. It's, uh, that I didn't give you yet. Um, they're in the Law Review article I explained. Now, it's very important to remember that the Iraqi Jews felt very close to their homeland and um, that 
The fact that there was fatwas then also goes to their property as um, in terms of real property and also any, any objects that they had. Maybe they had, uh, again, antiques, uh, book collections, whatever. They could not be sold. Um, estimates of the total expropriated property. Let's talk about that. So again, the information is scant. However, what we do have um, is a couple of interesting things. First of all, um, we have WOJAC, the World Organization of Jews of Arab Countries. Um, they estimate that it's about $300 billion worth of material at present value. Um, but Sidney Zabalov from the Jewish Center of Public Affairs says it's six billion. Okay? And I've heard estimates as high as 400 billion. I tend to quote Norm, Noam Stillman, who we spoke to before from Modern Times, who says 150 billion to 200 billion in his book Modern Times. He probably would raise that estimate a little bit just because of inflation. Um, and then there's Michelle Bard and Joel um, Hellenberg, uh, Myths and Facts, um, a concise record of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, he says property left behind was about 200 billion. So I'm just giving you some of the numbers out there. I think much of this may be, and, and you could tell me, it's very hard to estimate. Estimate. Okay. And so when I was asked to write this, I, I want to tell you, I put a lot of thought into it, but it's hard to do this piece. Um, not to say that I didn't try. Another interesting thing comes from uh, Israeli ambassador to the UN, Ron Prozor, on Jewish refugees in Arab countries. He wrote an article on October 15, uh, 2017, The Middle East's Greatest Untold Story. I agree with that, a taboo history, in Huffington Post. There he says there were 850,000 refugees from Arab countries, but this is the interesting statistic. He says that there were 8,500 Jews left. Now that number I've never seen as high. I would have said 4,000. Some of the estimates that I've gotten from uh, World Organization of Jews from Arab countries are more like, in, I think, 2012, more like about 4,500 Jews in Arab countries. And I think that number's gone down since 2012. Um, also, yes, thank you. Um, there's a resistance to providing the data on the, even the part of the Israeli government. So I've tried to get a lot of the information over many years. This is not something I tried to do just recently, but over many, many years. There were entry documents that were done by Jews from Arab countries as they came in that list their property, list human rights violations, and has a lot of information in it, but they are not public knowledge. There is also a census done in 1950, and were later censuses that were done that show some of the information that I'm talking about, but the only place you can get it is on the dark web. It was put there surreptitiously. You can get it go by going through tour on the dark web. Um, also, according to Ron Prosdor, the total confiscated land area is 40,000 square miles from Jews from Arab countries. That is about five times the size of Israel, the entire Israel. Um, there's another statistic, just if you're interested, in Wikipedia that says it's 100,000 square kilometers, four times the size of the state of Israel, the land that was expropriated or taken. Sometimes it's not actually expropriated, but the land cannot be sold immediately, and therefore it's sold at a deep discount. Now the last thing, and I'm not going to have time to go through it all, is to go through uh, how you make the calculations and about ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing talks about um, two things that I think are very, very interesting. Um, one thing is that this is higher than just um, human rights violation against an individual or even a group of people. It, it goes to a much higher level under uh, international law. And um, in practice, two remedies are applicable to ethnic cleansing, the right of return to one's home of origin, 
which is not feasible at this time, and the right to receive adequate compensation for one's property. Um, uh, states are legally obligated to provide compensation or choose not to return. And how is, it, how is this calculated? This is very interesting. Uh, some compensation, according to the Permanent Court of International Court of Justice, should be based on the value of the illegal taking. The payment of some corresponding to the value which a restitution in kind would bear. For other takings, the value of the undertaking at the moment of dispossession, when you took the land, plus interest to the day of payment. So it's when you took the land and then you get interest to day of payment. And these come from uh, an article that was written by Eric Rossman, The Right of Return Under International Law Following Mass Dislocation, the Bosnia precedent from, precedent from 19 Michigan uh, Journal of International Law. And also, uh, they talk about um, private takings of disposition of property in Ayel Benvenista's uh, and Ilya Zamir's uh, claims to private property in future Pal Israeli-Palestinian settlement. And so it's very important you look at that, and that's 89, American Journal of International Law. Um, I think our time is up now, but as you can see, it's a very, very complicated topic, and I do feel that the Iraqi Jewish archives will play a fundamental role in talking about what should happen to property of ethnically cleansed groups of people. So um, I'm very grateful for the preservation that's been done and the works that's been done. Um, and I think this issue has, has in a sense, risen to the top finally. Um, and at least the property issue is no longer taboo. But what I'm hoping is the history will not be taboo, because the human rights violations to me are much, much more, as I told the organizers, important to me than what is happening in terms of actual property. I don't see that being returned. But what I do see happening is that there's an important um, legacy to be told in what happened to Jews from Arab countries, and in part it's told through this dispossession of cultural heritage and property and actual real and physical property. Thank you. We have a